Yeah, that's working now. Perfect. Hello, good evening. I think we're about to start, and my name's appeared on the screen. Uh, my name's Stella Brutzi, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at University College London. And I, sorry, I've Hello. just gone and deleted my... I'm just going to do a very short welcome on behalf of UCL, which I've just heard one of my colleagues describe as the Wild West. So welcome to the Wild West uh, for, for, for tonight's Orwell Memorial Lecture. Um, welcome to From UCL, which is delighted to host the, uh, host the lecture and remains immensely proud of its association with the ideas and writings of George Orwell. The Orwell Foundation is based in UCL's Institute of Advanced Studies. The, the, the IAS, founded five years ago, is UCL's Centre for the Promotion and Enabling of Interdisciplinary Research. It's built up a thriving community of, of junior research fellows and, and visiting scholars and runs a rich programme of events around annual themes such as lies, laughter, traffic. I feel Orwell would have contributed uh, wonderfully to all of those. UCL is also home to the Orwell Archive, a centre for, for Orwell scholarship and the most comprehensive body of research material relating to, to George Orwell. One of the most visited of, of, uh, of UCL special collections, the Orwell Archive was presented in 1960 on permanent loan by Orwell's widow on, on, on behalf of the George Orwell Trust and holds the writer's manuscripts, notebooks and other personalia. The Orwell Archive has been added to since and UCL extends an immense debt of gratitude to, amongst others, Richard Blair, Orwell's son, for his continued support. George Orwell's personal archive at UCL was in September 2018 added to the UNESCO Memory of the World International Register. Complementary to the Orwell Archive is the Orwell Collection, which consists of rare and early editions of Orwell's works and translations, including first editions of all of Orwell's novels, many in their original dust jackets. Facsimiles of these comprise the first display um, in our new student centre when it opened last year. Long may the affinities between Orwell and, and, and UCL continue to be celebrated, from performed readings of his books at our annual Festival of Culture to this Orwell Memorial Lecture. UCL prides itself on being the home of disruptive thinking, promoting its ambition to discover the, the, the undiscovered and explore the unexplored, providing a, an, an excellent backdrop, therefore, to tonight's lecture. Now I'm going to pass on to Jean Is this the passing of the battle? Okay. <laughs> to Jean Th Thank you very much, Stella. Sorry, magnetic iPad. Is <laughs> um, I'm the director of the Orwell Foundation, and what we try and do is both uh, cherish Orwell's contribution, but also do work that's associated with his values and things. I want to welcome you all here tonight. I particularly want to welcome the young people who've been working in the Wiener Library on propaganda and elections uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're very grateful for you coming and I hope it's been fun and interesting. Uh, we want to thank all the people at the Archive event, event this afternoon. We'd particularly like to thank Richard Blair sitting there. Raise your hand just in case people don't know. <laughs> uh, who very generously sponsors us in all sorts of ways, but particularly this event. We had hoped to have his son and Orwell's great-grandchildren also here, which I, I remember thinking, before we knew they hadn't caught the train, um, was a terribly touching event because Orwell wouldn't have known that he would have had great-grandchildren to come and be part of his life. And we're also extremely thrilled to have Quentin Cop, who is George Cop's Orwell's commander in Spain. He's also here, so you've got direct bloodline uh, to, to Orwell. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we're very pleased that we're able to announce later on, you'll see a series of um, events that are, we're going to do over the coming year, incl including some very exciting new developments. We're also very excited to be able to announce the first Orwell uh, visiting research fellow at 
uh, UCL, which is, uh, which is a great scholar called John Rodden. So that's a first new thing. We hope to develop lots of scholarly interest um, out of here. And um, we, we hope, and we're particularly, obviously, thank you to Daniel Finkelstein, um, the, young, the young people who've been working in the Wiener Library, Daniel's grandfather actually set that amazing research resource going. So there's, a, again, another direct line of research and thinking and conserving and archiving that we're very pleased about. And I, the evening, Danny will give a lecture. Uh, then the, uh, our chair, Ken MacDonald, will give a thanks to that. But he'll say, you'll all have a time to do, ask questions of Danny um, about what he said, because it's about how to predict elections. So we hope he's, this time, got it right. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'd like to hand over to the to uh, Orwell's biographer David Taylor to introduce Dan. Thank you very much, Jean. Good evening. Very good to see so many of you here. I'll be very brief. Orwell's great friend Anthony Pohl wrote a novel once, shortly before the war, called "What's Become of Wearing," which is a publishing caper featuring the firm of Judkins and Judkins, and they have an author called Mrs. Gulliver Lawson, of whom it is she is advertised as having been everywhere and done everything. And I think the same could be said probably of our distinguished speaker this evening, Daniel Finkelstein. Uh, the list of his achievements in the political field and beyond it into journalism um, is extensive. He was there at the founding of the SDP. He was a director of the Social Market Foundation. He was a director of Conservative Research Office. He stood for Parliament against Ken Livingston, I think, at Brent East a great many years ago, but sadly failed to get elected. But I'm sure you will all know him now, as I do, for his columns in The Times, um, which have the, the true stamp of journalism, which is to say that you may not agree sometimes with the political views that run beneath them, but you can appreciate the cogency and the perceptiveness of what is there. Um, as for what he's going to talk about this evening, um, George Orwell was himself only directly involved in one election. It was the general election of 1945, where he canvassed certain London districts in the Labour interest. And he remarked in The Observer at the close of this experience that the really depressing thing about a general election was not that the people you spoke for, didn't, spoke to didn't like you or wanted to vote against you, but that they didn't know what an election was for or that one was actually on. So that was Orwell's experience of canvassing in 1945. Um, the rubric uh, on which we, when, when we approach speakers to give the Orwell lecture, is that they have to choose a subject that in however vestigial way Orwell would have been interested. And I think we can safely say that all would have been very interested in what Daniel's going to say tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Gosh, you, you made me sound absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to hear myself. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for all of you uh, turning up here. And obviously, uh, UCL is somewhere in central London near where I work. And I, I did once get invited to give a speech in Norwich which involved me in a four and a half hour journey to get there. And when I arrived, there were only two people there. Uh, and one of them was the person that invited me. The other person waited until I'd finished talking to him about why I was there and asking him whether he'd like to join the cause I was there to promote. And he said he would, but it would interfere with the terms of his parole. Uh, <laughs> so I'm glad I've got a bigger audience, hopefully fewer criminal convictions. And uh, I'd first of all like to, to start by thanking you for your kind invitation to deliver this year's Orwell Lecture. Um, the writing of George Orwell was my first introduction to both politics and journalism. I found his clarity and his wit captivating, and his understanding of the virtues of Britishness and his resolute opposition to totalitarianism are themes I greatly admire. As I told the House of Lords in my maiden speech, my mother was in Belson and my father was in Siberia and Pinner is nicer. <laughs> Uh, so it is a great honour to be asked to deliver a lecture in the memory of such a great man. In the summer of 2002, I was listening to the BBC on the way back from a political meeting when an academic came on to talk about the World Cup. He had, he said, created a model which would help predict the results of the tournament, and he proceeded to explain what he'd done. And the more he talked, the more convincing I found it. 
The next day I went into the Times, the newspaper I'd just joined, and suggested we find room for the ideas of Dr Henry Stott in the paper. The first match we chose to describe using Dr Stott's work was one between Senegal and France, which was widely regarded as certain to produce a French victory. Dr Stott estimated the chance of Senegal winning as 25%, much higher than everyone else. When Senegal did indeed win, the Times was very proud of itself, and I was commissioned to write a column on football statistics called The Think Tank that ran for the next 17 years. <laughs> now, neither Henry or I pointed out to my Times colleagues that what we had actually told readers was that there was a 75% chance Senegal would not win. And I suspected if this outcome had actually eventuated, there would have been no think tank. And perhaps my interest in predictions would not have developed as it did. My Orwell lecture on how to predict an election was originally scheduled to be delivered just a few days before the 2019 election. And I'm naturally glad to be giving it after we already know the result. <laughs> It makes things much easier. Now, this is for two reasons. The, the first is the obvious one. I would have had to give you my central expectation. This would have been what I regard as the most likely result, and it would have been what you remembered. However, because of the way the probability works, the most likely result leaves a very high probability of something else happening. Therefore, I could have been right and seemed wrong, Though it is also true, I suppose, that I could have been wrong and seemed right. And this would have obscured anything else I said. So I'm happy that my lecture doesn't have to rest on one sentence within it. But I won't be unfair. As I'd prepared a draft of this lecture before hearing that it was to be proposed, postponed, I suppose I should share with you what I would have said, especially as I said it to the Times board in the week of the election. I told them that I expected a moderate but solid Tory majority of around 30, and that there was a 25% chance of a Conservative landslide majority of more than 60. There is, however, another more important reason why I'm happy to be delivering this lecture without Election Day looming. It is that my topic would then have been interpreted as a description of what was happening in 2019, and to have little value besides trying to guess what we were all then desperate to know, who was going to win and enter number 10. But I didn't and don't wish to speak about how to predict the election. My subject is how to predict an election. And the reason I chose it was not to help listeners and readers win some sort of game. Critics are often pretty fed up with the way commentators spend so much time forecasting. After all, they say, we can just wait and see. But I think this criticism is wrong. In order to predict the France versus Senegal result, or indeed any other football outcome, we had to build a model. We had to work out which actions change results and which do not. We would get the probable outcome of a game wrong, say, if we ignored home advantage when it mattered. In other words, to get the model right, we have to understand football. And the results are merely a test of our understanding. The value of making predictions of political outcomes, then, is that to make them, you have to build a model of politics. You have to understand how democracy works and the relationship between voters and politicians. The success of your prediction is a measure of your comprehension. It also allows us to use one of the most valuable of all intellectual commodities, which is being wrong. Being wrong provides an opportunity to refine one's model and increase one's understanding. And so my lecture is therefore not really about clairvoyance or an impatience to know what is going to happen before it does. It's about understanding democracy. Before I begin that work, one further word about predicting things. A small hitch in my promise to tell you how to predict an election is that predicting an election is impossible. Uh, so it always aggravates me when a weather forecaster says that next Monday it will rain. They cannot know that. All they can know is the probability that it will rain. The best we can do with political events is build models that give you the rough likelihood that something will happen. So if anyone tells you they know the result of a coming election, even if they do so, having, do so having absorbed the main points of my Orwell lecture, you should realise immediately that they are wrong. 
So, a good place to start when making a prediction is with a warning. Experts commonly over-correlate for their expert knowledge. Nobody wants to be the idiot that spent time learning something that turned out to be irrelevant. And Philip Tetlock shows this clearly in his books on forecasting, which I strongly recommend. Most people who make election predictions are engaged with politics and know something about it. And it's natural for them to assume that this knowledge must tell them something about how an election will turn out. Let us say that you regularly or even occasionally watch Prime Minister's questions. It may be hard to appreciate that when making a prediction, little that you learn from that investment of time gives you an edge over someone who rarely, if ever, watches. Actually, it's worse than not giving you an edge. Watching Prime Minister's questions may actually reduce your comprehension of what's really going on. It may mean that you are taking into account information that has passed nearly everybody by. After helping William Hague to score a particularly gratifying victory over Tony Blair one week, I rang my brother-in-law to ask him if he'd seen our triumph. Of course not, he replied, I'm working. As indeed was almost every other voter. Now, my brother-in-law isn't typical. He's incredibly engaged with politics, politicians and political issues. But most people are not. And to a far greater degree than most political observers appreciate. Anybody who watches a focus group or goes canvassing, and I'm fascinated that that was George Orwell's experience as well, is immediately struck by how little people are following politics. Before the last election, polls show that half of all voters had never heard of John McDonnell. Only 18% were confident that they knew who Dominic Cummings was. Most reshuffles consist of replacing someone people have never heard of with someone else they've never heard of. <laughs> My friend Andrew Cooper conducted focus groups for David Cameron when he was leader of the opposition. Were there any conservative politicians apart from the leader that they had noticed, he asked. Groups were generally silent, unable to provide the name of a single current Tory. In one, the mental search for a Tory name ended with one of the groups shouting out, Ed Miliband, <laughs> to which someone else replied, yes, and his brother, Ed Balls. <laughs> The size of the highly informed majority is tiny. Quite a good measure was provided in 1966 by a US attempt to get voters to name as many members of the Supreme Court as they could. The proportion who could recall as many as half was 1.9%, and nobody could remember all the justices. Some of the earliest American pollsters were so shocked at the extent of public ignorance uncovered by their surveys that they suppressed the findings. They were concerned that they might undermine faith in democracy. Once they'd acclimatised themselves, they began to probe the ignorance that they had discovered. And led by pioneering uh, political scientist Philip Converse and taken up by others in the Converse School, it turned out that it wasn't just that large numbers of people didn't know central facts about policy and politics. It was also that they didn't have a consistent opinion about them. You could get people to express a view on almost anything, but that was because you were pressing them to give you an answer. People didn't just want to stand there saying nothing. They felt they had to provide a response. So they would say whatever sounded right to them or how they felt at that moment, and the order of questions and the exact wording became critical. If people were questioned on more than one occasion, they would very often express a different opinion to the one they initially gave. There seemed to be surprisingly little consistency over time. Almost imp as important uh, is that it was very hard to establish any consistent pattern that linked together voter attitudes, anything that might be called an ideology. And when pressed, voters rarely describe themselves and rarely do describe themselves in ideological terms. So the model of politics which sees views arrayed on a line with people at both ends and parties competing for voters in the middle isn't a proper description of people's politics. It makes neat patterns out of things that aren't neat and bundles together attitudes that may not go together or indeed voter attitudes that voters may not have at all. The other problem with this model is that it assumes that voters are able to place politicians on this scale, which requires them to know a reasonable amount about the politicians. 
Fairly recently, a study suggested that half of German voters couldn't place a party called Die Linke on a left-right scale. Uh, Die Linke, of course, is literally German for the left. <laughs> to summarise, during election campaigns and even between elections, there is a great deal of speculation about the impact of political events on voter attitude, and most of it fails entirely to account for the lack of engagement of most voters. It, isn't, it is going too far to suggest that nothing that happens changes anything and that watching the news tells you nothing. But I don't think it is going too far to suggest that when making predictions, any assistance you might gain from watching the daily ups and downs of politics or the comings and goings of politicians, and in this government there's, there's always comings where there are goings, it, <laughs> is at very least cancelled out by the over-reliance you put on the information. So... If watching politics carefully doesn't help as much as it should, what might help with a prediction? In some ways, what I'm about to say is encouraging. A central determinant of election results is how people feel about their own lives. I remember a conservative friend of mine engaging in a vigorous argument before the 2015 election about whether real incomes were rising. And I told him not to bother. Either they were rising, in which case people would feel better off and be inclined to vote accordingly, or they were not rising, in which case they wouldn't. The voters' calculation would not be changed by my friend winning or losing an argument on Twitter or in the House of Commons or even on the news at 10 about the correct measurement of changes in real GDP over time. Voters reward incumbent parties if they feel good and punish them if they do not, and it is hard to fudge this. What this means is that the state of the country at election time matters more than what any politician says. Now, this may not always appear to be the case. Much political coverage concerns process matters, who appears at a leadership debate, say, or gaffes on the Mar show. And at best, these hot political takes are merely narratives designed to explain political effects that are really caused by economic fundamentals. But just as often, the, take the fuss over Mr Johnson walking to a fridge in election week, they tell you literally nothing at all. Much success has been achieved in the United States using movements in real incomes in the months before the election as a way of predicting the outcome. And I regard real income growth as the first building block in any election prediction. In her compelling book, The Message Matters, the American academic Lynn Vavrek reviews presidential campaigns since the Second World War. The data strongly suggests that economic prosperity, or lack of it, determines the outcome. But not all on its own. The campaign messages do, messages do matter too. If the economy is in your favour, things are going well and you're in your power, or things are going badly and you're in opposition, the decision about what sort of campaign you should run is almost made for you. You must be the clarifying candidate, as Eisenhower was in 1956, Lyndon Johnson was in 1964, and Bill Clinton was in 1966, talking about the economy because the fundamentals favour you. All were successful, as was Barack Obama in 2008, running against the incumbent as a clarifying candidate in a weak economy. If the economy favours your opponent, you, as the insurgent candidate, are at a significant disadvantage. But there is something you can do. You can find an alternative issue, something else to campaign on. It is possible to win. Richard Nixon in 1968 won while talking about crime and disorder and the values of the silent majority. In 1976, Jimmy Carter won by campaigning on Watergate and the need for a cleaner politics. In 2000, George W. Bush ran as a compassionate conservative against a broken society. These are all Vavrek's examples, and they're American, but it's easy to provide Bushish ones. In 1997, for instance, the economy was strong. Tony Blair ran as the insurgent, as a fresh face who would end sleaze, bring change, and stop Britain's public services running down, and he left John Major's economic clarifying campaign on which I worked nowhere. The rules for selecting an issue aren't difficult and the data's clear here as well. Don't try to run as a clarifying candidate talking about the economy <coughs> if the fundamentals favour your opponents. This will never work. Find an alternative issue or preferably a bundle of issues tied together on which you enjoy a clear advantage over your opponent and which your opponent cannot neutralise. 
Once you have found this issue or theme, stick to it. It is difficult enough to make non-economic issues central, and you certainly won't succeed if you're not absolutely relentless. Before the 2015 election, Ed Miliband had many weeks in which his campaign seemed very successful. He'd attack on the NHS, or on Rupert Murdoch, or on tax avoidance, or on the squeezed middle, and he would receive favourable critical notices. But this success was entirely illusory because, in fact, he was breaking every rule. He was campaigning on real incomes when he wasn't the clarifying candidate, and he was hopping around from issue to issue instead of sticking to a theme and, and uh, picking a theme and sticking to it. The amount of effort and repetition required to establish a theme that is not economic is prodigious, and in any case, some of his themes, the power of Rupert Murdoch, for instance, were of only very slight interest to voters. Basing a prediction entirely on what was happening with real incomes would certainly have yielded better predictions in 2015 uh, than, than just following the election campaign. Perhaps one might add to this what is happening to the social fabric, to health care, to crime rates, to schooling, but these, however, are harder to measure, and in any case, people don't distinguish in clear ways between these things and their economic well-being. Now, I said in some ways all this was encouraging. If uh, voters cast their ballot because of improvements and deteriorations in the state of the country, it suggests that politicians are being rewarded for good decision-making and effective executive action. There is, unfortunately, a big but. Most voters, most of the time, cannot discern the cause of improvement or deteriorations in their or their country's circumstances. They reward and punish politicians on the most approximate basis. Mostly, they ascribe to governments blame or credit without conducting a very careful inquiry into whether that is reasonable. In a famous study, Christopher Atchin and Larry Bartels showed that when running for re-election in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson did worse in parts of New Jersey where there had been shark attacks. And floods and drought, droughts have a similar impact. And by the way, if what voters were doing was simply judging the handling of such disasters, you would expect that sometimes these events would produce a fillip for the incumbent, but this is not the case. The way voters apportion credit and blame has two consequences for predicting election results. The first is that timing matters. Voters are not making a measured assessment of the record of incumbents. They're expressing their view of how they feel right then and there and how they expect to feel in the very near future. So what matters is not real income growth across a parliament, but real income growth in the months leading up to an election and expectations for the months after it. In a celebrated debate moment in 1980, Ronald Reagan stunned Jimmy Carter. He asked voters to consider whether they were better off since Carter had become president. Ed Miliband once said that he intended to pose a similar question to David Cameron in 2015. Now, the irony is that the correct answer to Reagan's question was actually yes. They were better off. The problem was, in the last year, things softened, and right at that moment, they were doing less well than they had been. Voters don't measure their lives in general elections. They didn't recall exactly when it was that Carter had become president. They didn't know what they were doing and how they felt when he did become president. The question worked for Reagan only because of how things felt to, vo to voters when Reagan actually asked it. So in election, prediction should accord a prominent role for actual and expected real income growth, but only in the months before and after an election. The second impact on predictions made by the way people apportion blame and credit slightly offsets this, but in a fairly crude way. It is sometimes known as the pendulum effect. With each passing year of a government, an administration accumulates blame for losses that people experience. It may also get some credit for positive things that have happened, but people are loss averse, so the losses and knocks count more. There is also a rising feeling that people want a change of scenery. Perhaps things would be better if someone else was in charge. So slowly a time for a change spirit arises. The longer a party is in power, the harder it is to win re-election. The moment a party takes office, the pendulum begins to go back in the opposite direction. It is notable that the successful campaigns I mentioned and their themes, 
They defied economic fundamentals because they'd all found some way of saying it's time for a change. Betting on a government to win a substantial majority when fighting for a fourth term is brave. But it can happen, of course it can, and we know that because it just did. So how can a government win when fighting to retain office after almost 10 years when real incomes are only growing a little? At the beginning of 2015 election campaign, I was leaving the Treasury after seeing the Chancellor of the Exchequer, something I'd done many times over the preceding five years. And as usual, I was taken down in the lift by Kevin, the Treasury mess messenger. Well, Kevin, I said, thinking ahead to the campaign to come, this may be the last time you take me down in the lift like this. Nah, he replied. And this turned out to be a better analysis of the political situation. <laughs> than most people managed. While most voters do not follow politics carefully, they do have an instinctive feeling about the office of Prime Minister and who should hold it. As I've already said, few politicians have any sort of profile with voters. But this isn't true of the main party leaders. People generally do have a view about whether or not the candidates for Prime Minister are up to it. It's important to appreciate that what matters is the contrast Sometimes voters don't like either candidate for the top office all that much. What matters is who they like best. Attacks on the character of leaders often fail because they are attacks on characteristics that aren't thought unique. David Cameron was attacked at posh, as posh. But voters think all political leaders are posh. You have to be very posh in the first place to be able to distinguish between the poshness of David Cameron and the poshness of Ed Miliband. <laughs> When voters were told that Mr Cameron went to Eton, they just thought it sounded like he'd been well-educated. Uh, did it mean he was out of touch? All politicians are out of touch. A similar problem beset the attempt to persuade voters that they shouldn't vote for Boris Johnson because he is a liar. The difficulty is that politicians <laughs> believe that all voters are liars. All politicians are liars. And some of the effort to tell people that he was an especially bad liar ended up just making people feel they were being told they were fools. So the judgment about the prime ministerial qualities of a candidate combines an instant response to their personality with a gradually developing view of their capabilities. Policy may play some role in this, but not a careful weighing of different offerings, more a general impression of whether the leaders are strong and whether they are proposing a programme that seems broadly credible and attractive. Insofar as being centrist has a meaning at all, it may just capture the fact that someone looks reasonable and moderate and realistic. To ask if individual policy proposals are popular is to miss the point spectacularly. Impressions of whether a person is prime ministerial will also involve a few big moments when their judgment is tested, and I'm afraid impressions of what they look and sound like. There's little point arguing with voters about these. As a candidate in Harrow West in 2001, I spoke to a resident over the phone and asked her to vote Conservative. She said she would not because William Haig had a funny voice. <laughs> uh, I politely responded that if she didn't mind me saying so, that wasn't a very good reason, to which she replied, I do mind you saying so because it's my reason. <laughs> Leadership appro approval rating, ratings then capture a lot of data about voter attitudes and are crucial to any election prediction. Once these attitudes are set, they can be very hard to shift and they're impossible to dodge. As Tony Blair said after the 2019 election, no sentient political party goes into an election with a leader with a minus 40 approval rating. <laughs> One of Jeremy Corbyn's supporters among the new Labour MPs responded to this by saying, it's very easy for Blair to come out with these simplistic sort of points. Well, yes it is, because it's overwhelmingly obvious. <laughs> In 2017, voters did not have a settled view of either Theresa May or Jeremy Corbyn, and in 2019 they did, and this explains a great deal of the difference between the two outcomes. But not all the difference. If voters are not ideological, they have inconsistent views that change over time and that may not have much pattern, how is it that you can get big blocks of voters who rarely change their allegiance and who seem to know exactly which side they're on? The answer, I think, is demographic. People take their cue from what others like them are doing, 
and very roughly they assemble into coalitions at the root of which lies their self-interest. People who live together, socialise together and look like each other tend to vote together and form a partisan identity. There is a fair amount of evidence that partisan identity shapes views more than views shape partisan identity. A successful political party is one that can assemble a big enough coalition to defeat the others. An important skill for a political leader is to be able to unite groups of voters while his or her opposition fragments. In his book, How Brands Become Icons, Douglas Holt talks about how the traditional view of branding began to change. The traditional view of branding was that it was necessary to identify a USP, a unique selling proposition. Crest toothpaste has distinctive cavity-fighting ingredients. Dove soap is gentle on the skin because it contains one-quarter cleansing cream. Once these uh, USP had been identified, it should be tirelessly communicated as a benefit to consumers. And Holt calls this mind-share branding, trying to imprint a view of the brand's unique benefits on the minds of consumers. Yet Holt says that for many brands, this approach is not enough. And he dubs these other brands identity brands. An identity brand, Coke, Nike, Budweiser, Jack Daniels, is valued not so much for what it does as for how it makes consumers feel about themselves. So one of the earliest identity brand adverts was L'Oreal's slogan, Because I'm Worth It. The brand is brought largely to help the purchaser to define their own identity. And to promote an identity brand, you tell a story, one that resonates with people, one they want to be part of. Corona turned itself into the party beer with adverts that told stories of people drinking it on the beach at spring break. Mindshare branding works differently. It works by pounding on about the benefits of the product. And Holt believes that that is suitable, but only for low involvement goods or business to business services. Political parties are classic identity brands. The traditional explanation of Tony Blair's victory in 1997 was that he moved Labour back to the centre when it was on the left and thus won. I don't think that tells the story properly. Certainly, one element of his success was that he seemed credible because voters of all sorts thought him moderate and realistic. This also helped people struggling with voting Labour for the first time. They could see that Labour had changed and this allowed them to change too. But the key to Tony Blair's success wasn't really moving to the centre, even assuming such a thing actually exists. It was persuading a new group of voters, the aspiring middle and upper middle class, that Labour was for them too. People like you can and do vote Labour, was the message. And to prove it, I, Tony Blair, am like you. And this sort of appeal was even more obvious with David Cameron. The Tory policy shift wasn't great but a lot of effort was put into persuading voters that the Tory party was for the new, changing, modern middle class, that it looked and sounded more like them. The last 15 years has seen a slow realignment of identity and voting coalitions. Labour and the Liberals are appealing more to university-educated city dwellers, while the Conservatives attract older voters and those living in less densely populated areas. The Brexit referendum divided Britain into two countries, Livia and Romania. And the members of both of these groups felt attached to them and willing to reassess their past partisan alignment and their past voting behaviour in the light of their Brexit identity. So in 2015, there was the beginnings of a change, but 2019 was different. Let me use the principles of this lecture to analyse the 2019 election. By any conventional assessment, the period between 2017 and 2019 was a political catastrophe for the Conservative Party. The Foreign Secretary resigned, the Defence Secretary was fired, the Prime Minister couldn't get her legislation through on, everything, on anything, Mrs May looked weak, and politically she was weak. Every day brought a fresh, a fresh piece of political bad news. Yet much of this passed voters by. They, they noticed they'd voted for Brexit and it hadn't happened, but the goings-on, day-to-day goings-on at Westminster were a bit of a blur. The goings-on at Westminster always are. 
The Conservative Party fought the election, having governed for almost 10 years, and that should have made re-election hard. It was the main thing that tempered my view of the size of the Tory vote share. Real incomes were growing, which certainly helped the Tories, but not particularly strongly, and that didn't seem to me to support a landslide, though it was certainly consistent with a solid victory. But then Mrs May was replaced by Boris Johnson, and there was Jeremy Corbyn, as I've already discussed. And there was also realignment. In 2019, Labour rejected Levia fully, and its Levia voters reciprocated. Meanwhile, Boris Johnson was ruthless in the way that he united Levia behind him. I've come to the reluctant view that the removal of the whip from the anti-No Deal MPs, a move I was dismayed by, was essential to his victory. There were, after that, I think, only two questions over the size of the Tory victory. The first was the extent to which Labour voters would embrace their new identity. It was what I described at the time as the grandfather turning in his grave election. Would Labour voters be willing to abandon family tradition, if not by actually voting Conservative, then at least by not voting Labour? The second was the extent to which Labour, having abandoned Levia, would unite Romania. Would they be the party of more prosperous urban professionals? The answer to the first question, the grandfather question, was yes. The answer to the uniting of Romania was no, and Boris Johnson won a landslide. My own view is that the best bet for a new Labour leader would be to pursue the new voters it failed to gain rather than the old voters it lost. I think it will be hard to do both unless a political superstar is available, and I don't think one is. But I suppose if the next Labour leader seems to vote as like a Prime Minister and if real incomes falter just at the right time, then the feeling that it's time for a change could see them win anyway. I'm not predicting that. It may be too late to predict the last election, but it's certainly too early to predict the next one. Uh, let me conclude with this. I'm not cynical about politics. I, I wouldn't spend my life on it if I was. The experience of my family makes me appreciate the value of limited government on the law, or under the rule of law. I think a liberal democratic system is the best way of ensuring peace and freedom, as losers give their consent to winners holding office and making law. It's just that I think that a realistic view of the relationship between voters and politicians accepts that democratic accountability is a very rough and ready mechanism. Thank you. Well, it's, it's my, um, my very great pleasure on behalf of the Foundation and no doubt on behalf of all of you to thank Danny um, for that lecture. Um, that wonderful combination of um, erudition and comedy. Thank you, Danny. Um, like me, I I'm sure many of you hugely enjoy reading Danny's um, political writing, which itself has qualities of clarity and precision, which I'm sure Orwell himself would have approved of. And, and I think that was reflected as well in the lecture. And I I'd like particularly to thank Danny for rearranging the lecture at um, such short notice after we had to postpone it. But thank you again, Danny. Thank you. Now, we've got time for some um, questions, and I think the first question is going to come from one of the um, first couple of questions are going to come from some of the young people who have been attending the uh, propaganda um, working groups. Um, my question to you is um, following on from the House of Laws reform, um, do you think it's gone far enough, and if so, why? Do, do I think House of Lords' reform has gone far enough? Yeah. So uh, you've hit a question I don't really know the answer. In other words, what do I think about House of Lords reform? Uh, I think the, ha the House of Lords system is a bit daft, but the problem is every time I try and think of what might replace it, uh, I start to lose my way a bit. Uh, the, the problem is if you replaced the House of uh, Lords with an elected chamber, uh, you would either get a chamber that agreed to every piece of law that the government proposed because the government had a majority or stopped every piece of law that the government proposed because it did not have a majority. Uh, and um, you would get a legislative gridlock, uh, which leads me to think that 
if you weren't going to have the House of Lords as it currently is, it might be better to, have not, to only have the unicameral system uh, to work on the accountability measures inside the, the current House, uh, but I, inside the current House of Commons. But I can't think that's actually a very good idea. Um, so I suppose I rather wetly end up concluding that the best thing to do would be reforms of the composition and uh, methods of the House of Lords. It, it's too large, although much too much is made of that because most of the people, the reason it's so large is because people aren't full time and they're not there the whole time. And often in, in detailed debates there aren't that many people there, it's just the people who know something about the subject. In order to get enough people who know something about all the subjects we deal with, you have to have quite a lot of people. But probably there are a few too many people. And there's too much party voting, so I'd probably increase the proportion of crossbench to, uh, to non-crossbench peers. But what you do get with the House of Lords is that you get things sent back to the House of Commons, but uh, the House of Lords won't insist on it, so they don't stop it. And that is not actually such a bad system of review. So my, my problem is I, don't, I think it is a bit of a daft system, but I'm not sure I can think of a better one. Okay, we've got another question over there. Hello, um, thank you for your talk today. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, how do you think that you can engage more young people in politics, especially those that feel disillusioned in the wake of political issues such as austerity, Grenfell Tower, knife crime? Yeah. So first of all, uh, those will sound like an odd thing. Um, everyone always assumes that it would be a very good thing if people were, more and more people were engaged in politics. Actually, the best thing is if we lived in a country in which people didn't need to spend a lot of their time on politics uh, because um, they were able to leave, live um, stable and peaceful and happy lives um, without being concerned that what happened in government would determine their life or be oppressive to them. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that I necessarily think that what we're after is uh, incredible amounts of engagement. But what is important is uh, that people feel that um, politics and politicians are, and a liberal democracy under the law is a good system to run the country. And, the feel, and they are willing to give it credibility and accept its judgments. That's vital. Um, so it's less engagement than um, uh, willing support and having a less... Uh, poor view of, 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 it, of politicians. Go, go ahead and, and follow that up if I'm not answering. Sorry, um, which, by less um, engagement, did you mean not reaching out to younger people, although they're the next generation? No, no. I, so what I mean by it is um, I want people to feel um, that politics is accessible to them. Uh, I want people to feel that if they have a strong opinion um, or they want to change something, that they're able to do so, so that they have the ability to engage. I want them to feel that they've been provided with the educational tools that allow them to engage themselves in the system. Uh, but I don't want them to feel as though they can't live a peaceful and stable life in the country unless they're engaged in politics. I, I think that a, a country where uh, people feel a sense of um, reasonable satisfaction and acceptance of the social situation is what we should all... And a peace is what we should all be aiming for, rather than everyone feeling that they have to be, spend their life in meetings in order to ensure that it, everything was all right. Um, it's, it's hard to know exactly how to, to achieve um, the engagement they were talking about, that feeling of engagement. Certainly, I think, ensuring that in schools we explain to people what the different institutions are, that matters a lot, and giving people chances to participate so they don't feel it's so far away from them. I also believe in a decentralised type of government, so if you had more local mayors, for example, where the issues are more directly, people are more directly engaged with the issues and they weren't so abstract, uh, then people would also feel more of a sense that politics was near them and that it meant something to them. So those, those are all. But you know what? You may actually know better than I do uh, the answer to your own question. So maybe Thank afterwards you. we'll talk about it and you can tell me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, there's a question over here. Thank you. Um, it's about ends and means. You intimated that you had reluctantly accepted that sacking dissenters was necessary for this um, victory. I'm not absolutely clear whether you were comfortable with it, but necessary. No, um, and I wondered where you personally draw the line on things like Twitter and the Fact Check UK Conservative Party Twitter handle. Oh, okay. So um, it's a very interesting question because obviously one of the implications of uh, 
of my uh, address is that there's quite a, there's a much bigger uh, margin of appreciation for politicians to do things like that without anyone caring. So, uh, one, and um, one of the things about Dominic Cummings is I think he understands more of this than is standard for political uh, observers. I think, uh, to be honest, I think that's what he meant when he left the house, his house today and said uh, people should be reading Philip Tetlock on super forecasting rather than political columnists. What he meant is some of these big trends matter more than what happens. It doesn't matter if we appear on the Today programme and the fuss over Twitter doesn't matter at all because no one will vote on that basis. And he is correct about that. It doesn't mean it doesn't actually matter. No, but I'm asking um, morally. No, morally, yes, I'm, so I really, really saying. upset. It, me. it doesn't matter, and, you're, and I, I think you're, it does matter. Uh, first of all, on the on the issue of the of the MPs, I mean, I went as far as I, I voted with the Ben Act, in, uh, partly out of uh, solidarity to those members of Parliament, and partly because I agreed with that that move uh, in the House of Lords, without knowing what the consequence of that would be, and I didn't mind what the consequences were. It's just. Um, Unfortunately, I think that probably was a necessary move to win, the, to win a general election when I observed it afterwards, but, it, but I still disapprove of it. Um, uh, on the, if, I, if I'm honest, uh, I think the, uh, the, my actual reaction was that I didn't, the Twitter thing didn't bother me as much because I think it was fairly obvious what they were doing. Right. However, it, it might be the thin end of the wedge, and in that way, I did mind about it. I, I, sorry, just to say, I think, you're, I think you're making your own error in saying you think it was obvious. I think most people have no idea what Conservative Party central office Twitter handle is. Well, they also is. didn't follow the handle. So it sort of goes around. I'm just, all I can say is, you know, because you asked me how I felt about it, that particular thing uh, didn't worry me as much. More worrying was um, working out that you don't have to appear on the Today programme or on the Andrew Neil show. Those are more important types of accountability. That did bother me. Um, and uh, I was kind of glad that, the, that they were brought up short on doing that on uh, Twitter, but I didn't take it quite as seriously as other people did. Maybe that was wrong, but I just, that was the way my reaction was. Okay, we've got another, another question over here. Thank you very much, Danny, for your, your splendid lecture. I picked up one point. You talked about uh, liberal democracy and people having loose consent, allowing the system to run smoothly and all that, which I agree with you. How can you assess, as a, a senior commentator on this, why there was a clear lack of loser's consent after the referendum in 2016 by the Remain side? I, I know you were on the Remain side, but just your assessment of it. So, so, Jonathan, it's a very interesting question. Why, I don't know whether everyone heard, but why, uh, how would I assess the fact that there, there wasn't really loser's consent to the elect referendum result? Well, um, I, I think uh, Jonathan Sumption would argue that the failing was in holding a referendum. He would argue, it's one of the, his arguments, he's also, again, he argued this just after he did his wreath lectures. In his wreath lectures, he was arguing the law is a, not a very good way of achieving consent, and he uses Roe versus Wade as an example of that, where they haven't achieved consent by making compromises. And he then gave us another example, the referendum, because it was a black and white issue, uh, and people felt you know, they committed themselves on one side or the other. Um, and... Um, I think both of those have some value. Uh, a, a bit more harshly, I'm afraid I think that uh, it was also because the side that lost wasn't used to losing uh, and reacted to losing quite badly. Uh, and, um, uh, and to be fair, uh, my own reaction was different because I'd supported holding the referendum. In other words, I, I took seriously the fact that Parliament had been asked whether it supported the referendum and I had done so along, by the way, with everyone else. Uh, but it seemed to me that lots of people who asked for the referendum didn't seem to think that bound them morally, if not legally, to the outcome. Uh, uh, I found it, therefore, easier than some people who rejected the idea of ever having a referendum to accept the result of it. OK, we've got one, one back here, and then one here, and one over there. Um, thank you, Mr. Fingerstein, for a very interesting lecture. Um, I've got a few questions. Um, one point. Um, the point is um, the collective amnesia of the Tory party with regard to how they always tear themselves into pieces with regard to their position on whether they're either skeptical or either file wing. Um, secondly, um, in respect, in, um, the notion of people not knowing enough about politics, I think the real scandal, I think, of the political class and the establishment is this idea amongst... Um, 
uh, constituents that um, MPs are there to represent their interests. And if anyone studied the models of uh, the Westminster um, democratic system, we have a Birkin model of representation where uh, MPs are elected not in order to agitate a special interest groups for, on behalf of their constituents, but you elect MPs on the basis of their rational and legal and reasoning abilities. And with regard to the referendum, same shit, different day, i.e. legal referenda are not legally binding, and this notion that... Okay, okay, okay so yeah, my question yeah. is this. How would you see... Because um, in my books, the only way that real change can happen is if we reform the electoral system, which the Lib Dems okay. tried to do. Okay. So uh, do we I, go for... Okay, I think that's... I think, I think proportional I think representation... Two. Wait, two points. Proportional representation <laughs> and mandatory voting. So okay. you can abstain... Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank on you. an Australian system. Right. So proportional yeah. representation. Okay. And mandatory voting. I forgot, the, I forgot, unfortunately, your first point. Um, sorry. Um, so on well, the, the, the first point was about... And can, can we, can we, if we can answer it quite briefly, the first point was our MPs, delicate, delicates or, so, or, or representatives. So, so there were, there were the, four, the Conservative amnesia. Fascinatingly, in the, and that was partly what I was dealing with with the alignment point, um, the Labour Party turned out to have the most Leave constituencies and the most Remain ones. L um, ideologically, uh, Brexit was a really difficult issue for the Conservative Party. Demographically, it turned out to be a nightmare for the Labour Party. And what happened is that demography, as I would I would argue in this lecture, trumped ideology. So that's the answer to your first point. Um, on the issue of MPs as representatives, the problem with, with the referendum, of course, was that it cut a, across that. Uh, but once MPs had, as representatives, decided they were going to have a referendum, I think they, were then, uh, they then had some sort of obligation to follow through on the result. But it was complicated, I agree. Um, I'm not sure that the proportional representation would change any of the arguments I've made in this. It, there's, it's entirely different... Uh, argument. But I will tell you how my own views on proportional representation fluctuated. During the row that we had uh, about Brexit, I began to wonder whether a proportional system which would allow uh, members of political parties who were shackled to each other to be free from each other, not in this two-party system, uh, would be uh, an improvement. And so therefore to think that the arguments for proportional representation were very strong. Uh, but when you look back on the period that we have just had and our inability to make a decision uh, and the atmosphere that that produced, it does rather undermine the idea that electoral minority coalescing in groups of interests um, makes for a peaceful and cooperative society because it didn't uh, and it rather put me off the idea. Okay, and since this chap, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, since this chap had four questions, can you answer the fourth one, yes or no? What? Mandatory voting, yes or no? Um, I'm not in favour of it okay. on libertarian grounds, but by the way, if you, obviously if you were trying to do, I think my answer is this, if you were trying to do something that collected the view of everybody, on the wisdom of Crowell's principle, you would have mandatory voting. Okay. But if you believe, like I do, that the democratic system is fairly rough and ready, the libertarian arguments against it would trump that. Okay, I'm going to ask for short questions. A lot of people want to ask questions, and we have to finish by eight. So, here they and were then short. here. They were just multiple in his case. Yeah, well, four, four short questions is a long question. <laughs> Thank you uh, for your very um, stimulating and highly entertaining lecture. Um, I wonder where do you draw the line between balanced journalism and campaigning journalism. I was deeply troubled by the media during this past election period. Thank you. Good. Okay. So, um, different. The, first of all, hello. Good to see you. Uh, both um, uh, different kinds of journalists have different um, responsibilities and are employed to do different things. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, for example, the news reporters on the BBC News uh, try their very best, and it is incredibly difficult to do, to provide a balanced picture of the situation as they see it. They're definitely influenced by their own backgrounds and demography and their perspectives, but they try, the BBC tries very hard. I think it's hard, and all the science suggests that everybody thinks media that they watch is biased against their opinions, and everybody thinks that about the whole, that everybody on both sides, that's why everybody thinks the BBC is biased. Uh, with the same report will appear biased to both sides, um, because, because that's, and that's in the person watching as opposed to the delivery. 
comment journalist like me is not, I'm not aiming at balance. I'm aiming at polemic. I'm aiming at, I'm aiming to tell what I regard as the truth, but you may not see it as the truth. Uh, tomorrow I've begun a whole section of my column about um, the government um, being a bit like um, what the, the, uh, the, the villain in a Bond movie, which is the, the talking villain. They're continuously saying what they're about to do, only for the compound to explode just before they kill 007. Um, that's, not a, that's not a balanced uh, point. That's a polemical point, but it's still, I can make it as a comment, journalist. Okay, um, over here. The, 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 chap, the, the chap in the, in the blue jumper. No, 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 sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We'll you, sorry. Two blue jumpers. Yeah. It's not a jumper, <laughs> is it? Thank, thank you for your lecture. Very interesting. And I wanted to ask, um, do you think if Boris Johnson had been uh, the Tory party leader in 2017, if he'd have achieved that same result two years earlier? Um, it's possible. Uh, so the, 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 the things that were different were the two things. One is uh, real incomes were going down, um, and the other is the, d the demographic, the realignment that, he sh that took place in the last election was, was quite hard to achieve, and it, only, and it did start to partially happen in 2017. What's very hard to assess is um, whether it would have moved that far without all of the um, impact that was made uh, by, by, uh, by all the things that happened in Parliament, uh, and also by the fact that opinions of Jeremy Corbyn were not settled at that point, so a lot more Liberal voters were willing to unite behind him, whereas Romania fragmented in, in 2019. So my answer, I suppose, from all of those things, thinking aloud, is I don't think it would have been quite as big a majority, but he might have won a majority. Okay. The, fir the first blue jumper. Thank you. Can I, can I change countries and look at the US? Yes. Um, you talked a lot about um, the clarifying candidate. Is Trump, in your view, the clarifying candidate? And uh, cast your mind forward to November, assuming Bloomberg versus Trump. Who do you think is going to win and why? Okay, so, um, so Trump is 100,000% the clarifying candidate. Uh, he is, uh, he's fighting with a very strong economic tailwind uh, and he is fighting a, uh, for, a, for, a, for the, after a first term. Uh, those are very strong advantages. Uh, extraordinarily, he might still not win. Uh, and this is because, fortunately, all of his hijinks, to put it, let's use that phrase, do actually matter. Uh, Plus, in the United States, demographics matter, and a lot of demographic groups that didn't come out for Hillary Clinton, uh, in particular, uh, the, oddly enough, the female vote, uh, may now feel angry enough with Trump that they may vote with him. Uh, so I would think that Trump's chances of winning are about 60% because of the economic tailwind, and that's stronger than I thought a year ago. Um, but it's amazing that he has that chance of losing. Uh, I'm less fixated on who his opponent is. I think it does. I think that each of these opponents has got different advantages, including, you know, Bernie Sanders' appeal to people who don't have university degrees. Uh, but uh, Michael Bloomberg comes with a lot of money uh, and with the ability to get under Trump's skin. So um, he also has an advantage. But I don't think that matters as much as um, the. Uh, the Trump's own pluses and minuses. Okay. Oh, over here. Sorry, here. Sorry. Oh. Um, thank you for your lecture. I was surprised you didn't reference more uh, the interests and objectives of big money, dark money, and the partisan press. Because in retrospect, from my point of view, they, those seem to have been decisive factors in these outcomes. Yeah, would I you do. agree? No. no. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I would have included them in my model. Okay, so the best way of uniting the two of us is to say that I don't think they were any different in this election than any other election, uh, so therefore they don't uh, help you predict the election because they're a base. Um, but actually, I, I think it's less than that. I just think um, that, uh, first of all, um, the dark money thing is the addition of the word dark to money. I was just reading an article about this this afternoon, which is full of words like mysterious and dark and all those sort of things. And it was just money as far as the end of it. It's often describing a sort of dark money as two and a half thousand pounds that was given to somebody's local campaign. Um, so uh, I, my, um, my view of it is um, 
that lots of the money cancels itself out. The, the difference between the financing of both political parties isn't vast. Um, that, uh, and that the impact of the most print media responds to its readers uh, rather than sets the views of its readers. Um, and that uh, the people didn't like Jeremy Corbyn had nothing to do whatsoever with him getting a bad deal from the newspapers. Uh, and uh, people who like Jeremy Corbyn don't want to accept that because their view differs from other people. It doesn't mean that he wasn't great. I obviously don't think he was. What it means is most people didn't think he was great. Uh, and those are two completely different things. It's completely consistent to personally think he was great while acknowledging that other people don't. And without thinking that that constitutes a, um, some sort of distortion by the media, it may just be that you don't agree with everyone else. They, maybe they're wrong, uh, but maybe they're not. Okay. Uh, but maybe it's just for them. We, we can take two more as long as they're, they're short. Have you asked a question already? No, you. No, no, no. Okay, sorry. Well, so we'll, we'll take you, and then um, this, this chap here in the black jacket's had his hand up for a long time. So I'm sorry to everyone else. We're just, we're just running out of time. Thank you, Danny, um, for the lecture. Um, you mentioned about the ignorance of, without being pejorative, of members of the public when it comes to ongoing political matters, such as they don't know who's in the cabinet, etc. Every party claims they want the public to know more and social media gives them the opportunity to try to get through to them, they never do. Are they just fighting a losing battle or inevitably just very bad at doing what they do? Yeah, I think, uh, I think they are fighting quite a losing battle. It's intellectually frugal. I remember listening to a gentleman on the radio. He was, being in, he was in a quiz on the radio. And the question was, who was the dictator of Italy uh, when Hitler was dictator of Germany? And he, spent, he couldn't answer the question. Eventually, when it was must something... Uh, then he didn't answer, and the guy said, it's Mussolini. And, it, and uh, he goes, well, I'm a plumber. What do I need to know that for? Right? Uh, and I thought, well, I don't know where the stopcock is, and that probably is more useful. Um, so the, the, the truth is that it's, for a lot of people, it's intellectually frugal. Um, they can't tell the difference between Sajid Javid and Rishi Sunak. How useful is that for them? Or they can't tell the difference between, uh, you know, they don't know that Robert Buckland's Justice Secretary. You know, the, the, how useful is that information? So I, I don't, uh, the answer to that, question is I think people, it would take a lot to persuade people uh, to know more, but they do have an instinct about their own interests, they have an instinct about uh, who should be the uh, Prime Minister of the country. It's not, I'm not against education, we talked about that. Uh, I think people should have their civic rights and they need a minimum of knowledge in case they wish to exercise their civic rights. They should know how to uh, lobby an MP or they should know how to access justice. Uh, those things are very important, but I think it'll struggle. Okay, so this will have to be the, the last one. Can you, can you keep it relatively short? I'm, I'm sorry to everyone else. Um, my question was also about the media and um, kind of the role that the media play in forming opinions about how the country is doing economically, what people think of leaders in those groups you talked about. And I guess given this administration's switch to more direct communication, and this is the oral lecture, should we be worried about that and the fact that there is a, a less filtered medium going through? So I, um, I think one of, the one of the more encouraging parts of what I had to say, and some of it wasn't encouraging, uh, is that it's very hard to tell people how they feel, because they know how they feel themselves. Uh, and they're not going to be told how to feel by my article. They'll, they'll feel it. Um, so uh, in the end, some of, some of the politicians spend a lot of time in a lot of communication that they're sure is absolutely vital, and in fact actually doesn't affect people's opinions at all, because what really affects people's opinions is their own experience. And that's the, the most encouraging part. They may not know how to allocate political credit or blame for that experience, but they are, uh, their, their views often derive from their interests and experience. Like that's encouraging. I think that the role that the media plays in telling people what to think about things is therefore much exaggerated. Uh, because I think what they think derives from their interests and experience. Good. Well, thank you. Can I, can I um, on your behalf, thank Danny for fielding those questions? I'm sure we could have gone on for another half hour, but we'll have to close with that final question. Thank you very much again, Danny. I'd also like, like to thank um, Delia Jarrett-McCauley and um, Barbara Warnock, who have been organising our 
workshops um, this afternoon, and Jeremy Wykley and Alex Talbot, who've done a lot of work in the foundation office putting this together. Um, UCL for providing such a hospitable home for the Orwell Foundation. I think it's a very good fit. You've got so much of the archive, and we've got the passion and desire to see Orwell's legacy uh, maintained and indeed uh, enhanced. Um, and I'd like to thank, um, in particular, our incomparable director, Professor Jean Seaton, without whom I don't believe there would be a foundation or any of the foundation prizes and uh, Orwell prizes, and probably there wouldn't have been this lecture. So, Jean, um, thank you again, uh, and thank all of you for coming. Can I say that the, the Orwell Foundation runs a number of events um, during the year? You can find them all on our website, um, which is worth visiting. So I hope we'll see some of you at some other events during the course of the year. Thank you, Danny. Oh, there are drinks. Where are the drinks? The South Cloister. Just pour South Cloister. There, there's a, there are some drinks. So come and join us over there. Thank you all.